I would now like to introduce Hadan Hassan. She is the Communications Coordinator for CARE, the Council on American-Islamic Relations, a contributor to our book. Well, first, I'd like to thank RDV Books for inviting me today. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this effort, this very important effort, I think, to educate um, uh, the public on civil rights and civil liberties issues that are facing our country. Um, I'm also very heartened by the turnout today. Um, I can't think of a more timely discussion given, uh, for example, the recent court decision uh, on Yasser Hamdi. And there's also something else going on, which I'm not sure if people know. Um, there is an INS deadline tomorrow uh, in which Muslim immigrants from 14 countries must register at their local INS offices. Um, this is actually the second round. The first round took place in December, uh, on December 15th. And if anybody uh, read the news around that time, uh, in Southern California, people who went ahead and lawfully uh, registered with the INS found themselves detained and subject to, to deportation. Um, and these were people who were following the call of the INS, came forward. Uh, oftentimes they were here legally. They uh, were in the process of changing their status and found themselves handcuffed in line and, uh, and pulled away from family members. Um, so tomorrow, uh, in fact, all day today, we were getting calls from people who wanted to know a little bit about, wanted to know whether or not they were subject to deportation, wanted to know uh, whether or not, uh, what rights they had uh, as immigrants uh, or non-immigrants. And I think uh, it goes to show the fear that is in um, a lot of the American Muslim community, and specifically those who aren't citizens. I think we still feel, those of us who are citizens, that we have a lot of the basic rights. Um, but those who come here um, and are either studying or working, um, at this point they feel that at any moment they can be um, deported. Um, and I think like many people, we, uh, I actually speak for myself, I know I've always taken my constitutional rights for granted. Uh, I used to work abroad uh, with international organizations on women's rights issues, on uh, education issues, and I worked in countries where it was pretty normal for somebody to get picked up off the, off the street and put in jail without even knowing the charges against them. Um, or countries where certain ethnic groups were routinely profiled uh, by the uh, law enforcement. It was something that I always knew happened there, but never happened here. Um, I didn't expect to, uh, in fact, find myself working for a civil rights group. Uh, after September 11th, um, I found myself uh, in Washington, D.C., and decided to go and work with the Council on American Islamic Relations. Um, I'm going to read you a little bit um, from the essay that I wrote, just to give you sort of a personal perspective um, on how it has been working um, for, for CARE. A week after the terrorist attacks, I, went, I, I returned to Washington, D.C. and began working with the Council on American Islamic Relations. I was dispatched, uh, which is one of the largest grassroots-based uh, advocacy and civil rights organizations for Muslims. I was dispatched to the Civil Rights Department and was immediately put on the phone to take calls uh, cases from around the country. Every time the phone rang, especially the week after 9-11, um, my heart would leap out of fear that the worst was yet to come. Of the hundreds of people I spoke to on the phone, there are, there are a few that I will never forget. Um, there was the mother in New York whose teenage son was beaten so badly that he lost an eye. Or the paraplegic man who was removed from two planes because his Arabic name made stewardesses nervous. On a more positive note, there were many instances of Americans reaching out to their Muslim neighbors or colleagues in a sign of solidarity and support. Uh, we, our organization, received numerous cards and letters from all over the country expressing sympathy with the victims of hate crimes. And all across the country, Muslims, Christians, and Jews held joint vigils remembering the dead and praying for peace and for justice. Also, thankfully, the very public um, announcements by politicians, including President Bush, urging Americans not to lash out against their Muslim, Arab, or South Asian neighbors helped reduce, I think, the climate uh, of, of anger in this country and subsequently the hate crimes. However, as the public anger uh, against people who were perceived to be Muslim declined, uh, we saw an increase uh, with complaints about the, I, about the INS, the FBI, um, 
the subsequent passage of the USA Patriot Act, Patriot Act in October of 2001 uh, and the increasingly aggressive tactics by the Justice Department in its investigation into the 9-11 attacks, uh, we notice a dramatic increase in, in, in the cases of, of discrimination and uh, profiling on a daily basis. On a daily basis, to this day, we receive reports of people who were visited uh, by, you know, in the morning by, by the FBI, visited at their work by the FBI or INS, and have had to sometimes uh, lose their jobs or fight for their jobs because all of a sudden now they're considered uh, potentially um, de a, de a threat to their coworkers, even though they were just uh, questioned by the FBI. Now, the dragnet approach by the law enforcement with the detention of over 1,200 people, almost exclusively Muslim immigrants, has resulted in serious civil rights violations. Uh, as a civil rights group and as somebody who, who's a, an activist in this area, um, we, were, we were able to advise people on laws. Oftentimes we were able to advise people on laws that could protect them if their rights were violated. So for example, if somebody was discriminated at, at work, there, there is a mechanism. There's the EEOC where they can go and file a report. If they've been the victim of a hate crime, they could go to the FBI or the local police. But um, what can I tell a wife whose husband is being held on secret evidence, not made available to his, her, to his lawyer? Um, there's little recourse when the law actually sanctions uh, such violations of our basic constitutional rights. Time and time again, I would hear from callers that this isn't the America they imagined. Uh, what happened to due process? What happened to the right to a, a, a public and speedy trial? Um, there are many people who are still being, who are still held in jail. Uh, the numbers at this point we don't know because the Justice Department won't make that public. Uh, who are waiting to be deported or actually find out what the charges there are against them. Um, now, the challenge, I think, for civil rights organizations is to convince Americans that we don't need to sacrifice our fundamental constitutional rights for safety and security. I think, as Michael alluded to, there is a real uh, need uh, for our country to be vigilant and to protect uh, ourselves from, from a future attack. But we have to really look back and, and, and look at some of the measures that we've used and ask, is this working? Uh, and I think that, uh, I think thankfully, I'm, I'm, try I'm an optimist by nature, so I think that the building blocks uh, for a coalition that, that's seeking justice and transparency in our judicial system are carefully being laid. And I think tonight the turnout uh, indicates that people are curious about these issues and are concerned about these issues, and, um, and I hope that things will change. Thank you very much.